ahead, Lisa. Oh, I didn't know I was starting us off, but you I will. <laughs> um, welcome everybody to the kickoff of the 2022 Jacobs Teen Innovation Challenge. I'm Lisa Dolly. I'm the executive director of the Jacobs Institute. And you'll meet some of the other team members here in just a minute. This is our third annual challenge event. We've learned a lot along the way, and we're really excited um, this year that we're launching our virtual exchange option. Um, the ability to partner with teachers in other states or other countries um, as you work on the challenge event. So next slide, please. And if you don't mind, um, while we're introducing ourselves, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself in chat, um, who you are, what do you teach, where do you live? That would be um, great for us to get to know each other um, while we're working through this front end. So as I mentioned, I'm the executive director and one of the um, inventors of Packful, and I'd like to introduce um, Moni Kalish, our Director of Technology. Do you want to say anything, Moni? Uh, sure. I'll be saying a little bit more later, but um, okay. you've been getting a lot of emails and communications from me. Um, that'll probably continue, um, but I, my background is in um, educational technology in general. I spent 15 years working with Connections Education, one of the two uh, nationwide virtual providers in the U.S., um, helping to create a virtual public school throughout the United States. So my background is sort of in virtual in education and in building platforms and tools and supporting them um, with a lens toward education and helping students thrive. So we're so glad that you guys could join us here. Those of you who are here live, we really appreciate that. And I will also give a shout out to the many people who were unable to make it live for obvious reasons, including the fact that it might be the middle of the night for some of you, and we're sorry for that. Bianca. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I want to say thank you for, for connecting and joining us in, in this challenge. I know we're going through different circumstances at various levels. So um, we're very grateful to have you all here. Um, my name is Bianca Alvarado, and you're going to see more emails come from me as we progress through the challenge. I'm going to be in charge of the virtual exchange program that we're piloting as part of this program. And my background, I come from uh, the world languages. So I'm a Spanish teacher um, credential and mostly in high school at the high school level, implementing project-based learnings and also a lot of projects that relate to youth creativity and really trying to shape the education and the, the way that we're implementing technologies with, with students. Um, in a way that is meaningful for both for students and educators. So again, I'm um, thank you for having you here and um, you're gonna be getting more emails and I'll be sharing a little more about the program as we progress through the site. Thank you. And Dr. Lynn. Uh, hi, I'm Lynn Lear and um, I. Uh, this is my second year with uh, the Jacobs Institute and uh, I really enjoy the work that we're doing. I especially uh, enjoy this part of our work because um, it integrates so many great things, especially having students trying to figure out how to solve some of the real problems of our world. And I will probably be working with you uh, in terms of finding uh, different institutions that might support the work that you're doing. Um, when you, if, with the prizes and things like that. So anyway, thanks for joining. It's great to see so many of you here. Thanks, every, thanks everybody. Um, I did want to mention, you can see our um, icons are for Twitter and Instagram if you hang out in those places and we'd love for you to follow us. The Jacobs Institute is a research and development um, institute supporting inclusive innovations with K-12 schools. And we are based at the University of San Diego. Um, so we love supporting uh, this work. Next slide, please. Um, at the core, at the very heart of the work that we're doing, we believe that teens working with their teachers can build a better world. And we're assuming that if you're here tonight, you probably believe that too. Um, and out of that belief though, we know that there are problems um, that teens encounter in trying to create innovation to make a better world. So I'm just going to give a background about some of the data points that we know and why we are engaged in this work with you, um, Moni. Uh, first of all, 
your tendency to become an inventor slash innovator can depend on where you grow up. Um, this is a map of the United States. And the areas in dark blue uh, where uh, represent high levels of patent production. And so out in San Francisco and San Jose, you get Silicon Valley and all of the uh, high tech type work that goes on there. In Minneapolis, you've got a big medical device community and a lot of patent work that goes on there. And so in cultures like these, innovation is rich. There are a lot of incubators, there are accelerators, there's money and investment. There are other parts of the country, um, for example, the Southeast, which you see on here, which in white, where there's a lack of innovation. And so this not having access to innovation culture, the funding, the networks, the language, the commercials on TV um, can influence who becomes an innovator. Uh, so this is one challenge that we're trying to conquer with the teen innovation event. Next slide. Um, Pat, your, your tendency to become an innovator can also be based on your parents' income. So the blue dots um, are parents' income, starting down in poverty at zero, going all the way up to the top 1% uh, of wealth in the country. And you notice that as wealth goes up, so does the tendency to become an innovator um, to the point where you're 10 times more likely to innovate um, if you're in the top 1% of wealth than you are if you're living in poverty. And so creating access to innovation culture for kids who live in poverty is one of our goals as well. Next slide. And by the way, as, I'm, uh, as we're sharing and presenting, if you have questions or um, comments, please feel free to share those in chat. And if uh, a non-presenter wouldn't mind reading those out, that would be really helpful. We're really trying to also um, attack access by gender. Um, Bell and Chetty, who are um, famous professors out of uh, Stanford on who becomes an innovator in America. Um, we know that uh, in general, females, you can see right here, 18% versus males, 82%. Uh, this gets even worse when you look at female founded companies. So let's say I innovate and I, I wanna go look for funding for my company and launch my company as a CEO. Um, venture capital funding is limited right now to 2% uh, for women. The other 98% is going to men. Um, so just access uh, for women in general uh, to entrepreneurship and innovation opportunities, it's getting better, <laughs> but it, the data shows it's getting better, but at the current rate, it would take something like 118 years to get gender parity. Um, and we don't wanna wait 118 years for equal opportunity. Um, so that's another goal that we have. Next slide. Uh, when we break down by race and look at innovators by uh, patent rates by race and ethnicity, um, you can see here just uh, people of uh, Asian culture are, um, are more than double actually um, than people, white people. And then when you look at black and Hispanic people, it's very, very limited opportunity. Um, to engage in innovation. And so one of our goals has been to outreach to underserved populations, kids living um, in poverty, and um, just creating opportunity for kids of any race. Do you have one comment, uh, Lisa? There was a uh, question um, from Jessica Wing. Uh, how accessible will this be for students living in less funded areas? I work in Alaska, was her comment. So we hope that the the way that we've made this accessible one um, it does require an internet access uh, but we know that 98 percent of kids in america do have internet access either through mobile or on um, their schools uh, and, and so as long as you have access to internet or the teacher does and has the ability to download the materials um it's accessible the opportunity is accessible no one's limited we're also interested in, because this is a global challenge, um, we've had students in over, Monty, you can <laughs> correct me, I know it's over 22 countries um, participate in the challenge event. Um, the innovation at a, at a country level, at a national level is important. It's what drives innovation and the economy. Innovation drives the economy. So where there's innovation, there's money. Where there's money, populations thrive and don't live in poverty. And so this idea that how do we 
not only uh, work, um, you know, to develop ourselves as innovators, our local community, but can we think also about um, helping on a global level as well? And I believe that we can. This is a report put out by WHO, I think this was last year, just looking at countries um, by innovation, but actually I've heard since this report came out that the US dropped out of the top 10 for the first time ever, um, very recently um, in its innovation indicators. So, you know, we've got a ways to go, um, I think not only at home, but across the world in general, and just helping people understand that they can have both local and global impact. And so for all of these reasons, uh, whether it's gender, race, where you grew up, your economic situation, the country that you live in, um, this is Bellinchetti, they estimate that there's millions of what they define as lost Einsteins uh, due to inequality to innovation culture. And so th this idea that every kid or most kids could be Einsteins if we gave them the opportunity to think as innovators um, and solve problems. And in this case, we're uh, focused on social problems as aligned to the global goals. And so- That brings uh, us to- Yes, the, our innovation challenge. And I'll what, let you- What is the here. Jacobs Teen Innovation Challenge, which is, brings us here today. So um, fundamentally, this is a design thinking opportunity for and we use the word competition, that's intentional, but it's obviously there are benefits beyond just the competitive aspect. Um, it's a competition for teens and helping them to become empowered and think about innovative ways to solve local and global problems. We specifically have a social good uh, angle on our work and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But ultimately, sometimes teenagers don't feel like they have the ability to really make a big impact on our world, but we know through challenges like ours that that's not true when they're given access to innovation tools and culture and opportunities. And in fact, quick story from last year's winners, um, Lisa and I and a couple of other colleagues had an opportunity to um, interview the, the student team who won last year. And there was this one girl in particular who said, Lisa asked like, what advice would you give you know, future teenagers or fellow innovators? And her reaction was, I never thought of myself as this person who would give that kind of advice or as an innovator. That's the kind of magic moment that we're looking for. Um, so it doesn't have to be just the winners. We saw that evidence, uh, you know, heard evidence from educators that they also saw that in lots of other students. So that's what brings us to this work. So very quickly, um, the challenge requirements, I think by now you've probably seen them on our website and stuff, but the, the big gist is that we're asking educators and we use that term intentionally. We have mostly teachers, some are in a classroom, in a traditional classroom, some are in you know, interdisciplinary you know, courses, some are working together, some are doing after school programs. We have boy, you know, Girl Scout, Boy Scout clubs, after school programs, a robotics club here. In some cases, we've got individual parents who are supporting um, you know, a student group. In some cases, it might be one, in others, it's other, it's multiple. We are treating everyone as an educator, um, and that's intentional on our behalf, but we ask the educators to help coordinate the challenge event with, with students, collaborate with us and the Pactful community, and support students along their journey. And students, um, we look for middle and high school students, they need to be 13 plus. Um, that's primarily because of COPA, the regulatory requirement in the United States. If you are um, an educator who has 12 year olds as well, as long as your 12 year olds are paired uh, on a team with at least one 13 year old, so that the 13 year old could do the, the tracking and the support in the Pactful app, which we'll get to a little bit later, that's the key piece, that's what we're looking for. And everyone participating needs to use a Google account in order to access Pactful, that's simply because that's the tool, that's the mechanism we have for authentication into the app. Um, and also that's the mechanism, Google Drive is the mechanism that we use for um, establishing evidence of the activities that students are working on throughout. And we'll get into that when we do a quick demo later. And I will make a note and we'll, you'll see this theme again, it kind of hits on the important piece of what Lisa talked about. We encourage you to the best of your ability. Some of you may have only a few kids, so you can only do what you, what you can, but we encourage diversity of race, gender, um, et cetera, in your student team. So think about that as you're trying to help students form teams. 
Jumping quickly into the timeline, there's a lot of, you've seen some, you know, various dates and things like that. Today is the kickoff. This is the opportunity to bring educators together, hopefully get you all excited about the work you're going to do, arm you with the right information to take this to students. But you're not alone. This is a community, as you can see. There's great opportunity for you to engage with each other, with us, um, today and throughout this experience. And so on an ongoing basis, we will have these webinars to bring everyone together and you know touch base on where, how things are going, talk about the upcoming phases that you'll be working on, answer any questions, et cetera. The most important date that you need to think about is April 30th. That's the final submission deadline for submitting uh, the video pitches to us for consideration of prizes. You're welcome to use these dates as you know, some scaffolding around uh, the work you're doing with students. Some of you only get to meet with students once a week or you know, only have them for a month long period. So you've got to kind of adjust your schedule with students. That's completely fine. As long as you kind of work it out as best you can, and leading up into the April 30th deadline. And I Monty, see. yeah, Kim just Kim made a comment that his school doesn't start till February 2nd, so his students won't be good to go till mid-Feb. Totally fine. Like yeah. that, that kind of experience is fine. We are gonna actually do something with an on-site camp where we're gonna try to run a group of physical um, students through this experience over a one-week period in March. We've got people running the gamut. Some technically started actually a couple of months ago because they have a year long design thinking class. Um, so really the ultimate date here is April 30th. That's what I wanted to make sure you understood. And then Martha asks, are the webinars for educators, students, or both? Our primary audience are educators, but I know in some cases, some of you have asked us if you can you know, invite students along or if they can watch them. And of course the answer is yes. All of our work is open, but we kind of tend to focus and we talk to educators and try to help you think about how you might frame this with students. But if we have students here um, today or in the future, that's great too. We're excited to have everyone involved. Within the competition, everybody wins, right? Because we're taking steps together to help, you know, build up the better world that we all want to live in. But in addition to that intrinsic reward, we're you know, helping teams learn social, social responsibility by the winning teams having an opportunity to select a charity to make a contribution um, from the Jacobs Institute. So winning teams and their solutions will also be celebrated on social media, on our website, um, and in other ways. And so you can actually go to our website um, and see all of the pitches from last year, from the last year. I'll give you a link to that here shortly. Um, let me find it really fast. In case you want to share this or uh, with your students or take a peek, you can see all the winning teams from last year. It was a fantastic culminating experience. The prizes are a part of the incentive, but we also know as educators that that's not the only, that's not the real outcome. We're actually trying to make a difference in the world and help students become prepared to do that and think about the world differently and be able to think of themselves as innovators. We are excited. I mean, to I just wanted to mention, I'm sorry, down at the bottom that um, all students, regardless of whether they win or not, will receive a customized certificate of participation with their name on it. So it's just a little recognition. This year we are excited because we have an additional sponsored prize for this year's challenge. Um, you do not have to do it this way, but student teams who create a solution in the field of photonics are additionally able to receive a prize award of $1,000 for charity for a charity. And so we've been approached and had a great connection with our uh, partner DRS Daylight Solutions. They've offered this opportunity because they're trying to work on ways to help incentivize students to think about the field of photonics, um, which is honestly not a field I was familiar with in that, in that name until um, I had a chance to speak with them. But really it's about the physical science of light waves. So photonics deals with the science behind the generation, detection, and manipulation, um, and the important role that light plays in the technologies we use in everyday life. And so some great examples include the laser light fiber optics, infrared, um, all sorts of things related to photonics and light. So I'm not suggesting that you have everyone do this, but if there is an interest in this area, there is an additional prize to potentially be won this year by a student team uh, who creates a solution in this field. If you have any questions about that, um, now or later, we are happy to, to go over it, but I did want to just share that 
It's an additional opportunity in case you're interested. Throughout the competition, um, we will be also be giving storyteller awards to teachers for teams who share their progress on social media. So part of the thinking here is that we are trying to, part of the work that we do is not only in helping students create a solution to a problem, but also help them tell their story. And Lisa, I think you've got a good anecdote to share about storytelling where this really comes into play. You're going to have to remind me because I don't remember what story I told. <laughs> about the Shark Tank engineer versus story. Oh, oh yeah. Recently, um, Kevin O'Leary on Shark Tank was being interviewed and he, uh, somebody had asked him like, what's the most important job a person can get? And he said, for years, he used to think it was engineer because engineers are the builders or the ones who go out and get patents, um, start companies, et cetera. And he said, ever since COVID hit, um, he believes that the most important career someone could have is a storyteller, that the storytellers are changing the world because through the digital medium. And so whether you produce video or um, take photographs or you're a graphic designer or whatever level you might participate in the storytelling that the storytellers are the people currently impacting the world. And I thought that was a really beautiful analogy. And we're just trying to support that with students and helping build their digital um, communication skills um, in an appropriate way, using social media in a positive way to talk about their progress with their teams um, and within their classroom. And then the same for teachers, helping teachers uh, feel confident in sharing stories of what's going on with their students and in their classrooms. And to help encourage that, um, like I said, we, we give away storyteller awards throughout the process. So, you know, as students, if you're sharing, you know, pictures or videos or work that they're doing, um, or they are, um, it's a fantastic way for us, for everyone, including everyone in this community and the world to be able to see some of this work and see it progress. And so we want to encourage that with some of the storyteller awards. And leading up into something new this year. Bianca. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so just I'll go over the virtual exchange program. I just want to remind you also if this is a good moment, if you have any questions or comments about the program, post it in the chat and we'll get to those um, as we go through the through the presentation. So this year, as mentioned, we have a great opportunity for you to join our uh, optional virtual exchange pilot. So it is optional. Uh, we want we are cognizant of, of how much work you're doing right now through the different transmissions that we're going through. So I want to explain how the virtual exchange pilot program pilot program is going to work. It's not um, my hope is to make it as as focused on relationship building as possible and not so on giving you just more work. So the way the program works is that we're going to help you um, connect with another teacher who's also or educator who's also participating in this in the challenge. So that's one of the advantage that it's going to be someone who's also familiar or related or going through the same experience as you are. Um, it's going to be up to you both to decide to what level of engagement you want to uh, engage in. So, so, for example, you can choose to work on the particular on the same um, global issue or community issue uh, as a solution or project. So it's going to be up to you to decide the details of working together. Um, and of course, you get to develop global competency skills not only for you but for your students um, who are going to have the ability to connect with other students, maybe from 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 another country or within, within the US, maybe another, another state within, within the US. Um, so how are we gonna do this? We're gonna provide a creative community, again, where you're connecting with those in, uh, another instructor or educator within the same community that we are a part of here in the challenge. We're gonna provide you uh, digital materials and tools uh, related to cross-cultural relationship building. So some of you might have experience on this already, maybe by collaborating previously with another person from another country or another culture, but we are gonna provide those tools for those of you who want to take 
aside of reading or uh, strengthen, strengthening your skills in cultural relevant um, relationship building. Um, and we are also going to provide what we are calling guiding activities. So guiding activities are gonna be prompts given to you as an outline for you to implement within a time frame, And those time frames are gonna be um, aligned with the times that we're meeting here uh, through the webinar. So you're gonna have a time frame to, to get together and meet and implement those guiding activities. Again, all of those prompts are gonna be uh, shared with you, but it's gonna be up to you uh, and your uh, matching uh, educator to decide the final details of that. Uh, so how to participate. So if you want to participate in this virtual exchange pilot program, um, you're going to fill out the, the form and I'll share it with you through the I'll, link. I'll send it to everybody after. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so we're going to send you the link. You have to complete this form. It's a very short form. Uh, some details about your classroom so that we can, we can take that insight in forming the relationship building and the matching process uh uh for you um and please complete this form by friday if you're able to you can complete it right now also uh you're also going to have the weekend so we just had to put a, a deadline there for you on this friday but of course with this with everything that is happening our our goal is to be as flexible and understandable uh, of the process that you're going through so if you ever have any questions or feedback or comments or are struggling through something, just send us an email and we'll provide that information at the end. But once you click on the contact form, you're gonna see the basic questions. And again, and again one of the, of the, um, of the questions uh, that I want to add more clarification on is if you're willing to partner with somebody else within the US. So depending on what we see the response on how many educators are responding, maybe from a different country, um, you might end up with a, uh, with pairing with another educator within the U.S., but it's still a cultural or a, a, a exchange experience because you're learning with for, with from an educator from a different even even within that different community, right? You can make a difference. So we hope that you're able to join this experience. And again, if you have any questions on this, feel free to add those in the chat. Um, but hope hope you're able to to join us in this pilot program. Thank you, Bianca. Um, just a couple of extra comments. So I'll be sending out, and this kind of addresses the some of the chat questions too. I'll be sending out um, after after tonight's webinar. I'll be sending out an email to everybody, um, which will have a link to the recording from tonight, the slides, as well as the form that Bianca is talking about, and a few other reminders. So you don't need to worry about taking notes. It's all going to be coming your way. Um, here shortly tonight, right after we're done. So, um, and just on that one note, the, the reason that we started, we did ask a question, you're not necessarily going to be paired with somebody within your own country. It's just that we had so many, so much interest from people in the US and we may not have right, the right number of, of participants to pair everyone. So we were expanding our thinking a bit, like there may be situations, but that is one of the questions and you can indicate that you don't want that. Um, the risk there is if we don't have enough, we may not be able to pair you, but we're going to do the best we can. And this is a pilot for us. We're here to, you know, we're doing the best we can. If you've got feedback or suggestions or comments along the way, please don't hesitate to share that with us because that, that's the whole idea behind this pilot. Thank you, Bianca. So I want to lead us into, uh, we've kind of talked about the challenge a little bit, we framed some of the research behind it. We talked about the challenge, the timeline, the, the prizes, the virtual exchange, and then the sort of the mechanics behind how you might get this work done. And so the Jacobs Institute has developed a platform and curriculum uh, to support you throughout this challenge. And so um, I'm gonna play a little brief video. This is an actual video that is in the Innovator's Guide Impactful. We have several of these short videos. They're intentionally 90 seconds or less. We have several of these videos to kind of help introduce the various phases. And so I'll show you this now and we'll talk about it a bit more. Anyone can be a social innovator. Social innovation is all about people around the world working together to solve local and global problems. 
In 2015, the United Nations agreed to make the world a better place by establishing 17 global goals. These goals offer a framework to address large social challenges such as poverty, hunger, and climate change. Here, you'll develop an innovator's mindset to tackle any challenge and create solutions aligned to the global goal. These solutions could be something as small as how to handle food waste at home, or as large as how to provide clean drinking water to anyone in your city. To make the world a better place, it takes people like you working in teams. Using the design thinking process, you'll identify issues, brainstorm ideas, and prototype incredible new solutions to problems that affect us. Your team will work through three phases of design thinking, understand, ideate, and prototype to create a solution for a local or global issue. When complete, you'll also develop a pitch to share your work with a larger audience. Have you ever realized that everything in the world is design? Not all designs are good. With an innovator's mindset and design thinking, you will redesign the world and make it a better place. Get ready to become a bold and powerful innovator. Oh, I didn't went to jump ahead and I didn't mean to. Um, so that's a, a, just a little introduction to what Packable is. I'm gonna show you the, the Packable platform a little bit more um, after a while. I did wanna make a comment that you know, we leverage design thinking throughout this uh, experience. And we have taken, if you're familiar with design thinking, you may be thinking of the typical five phase design thinking approach. We've simplified that into those three phases, understand, ideate, and prototype. You will still find all the elements from the, the complete five uh, phase uh, model in our model, but we simplified it for a teenage audience. And so um, that's where you get the names different in case you're thinking about design thinking. It's the same approach, just, just a little bit different. We also added a pitch phase um, because we because of that storytelling component that we think is really critical and important. So as you start thinking about how you're going to get started with students, we want to give you a couple of thoughts about doing so. So a couple of comments. Um, you can do, we everything here is based on teams. Um, and we think the ideal team size is three to four students. We've had teams as few as one. In some unique circumstances, we prefer to see them at least two. We've had teams as large as six or even more. I think we can all understand that that causes some potential other logistical issues, but you, you know, up, that's ultimately up to you to kind of make those decisions and help guide them down that path. You'll invite students into the Packful platform using your class code. I'll show you that. That also appears on your dashboard. And as you start thinking about student teams and forming and getting started, we would ask you to um, either help students form teams around a local or global problem. That's the ideal scenario where they pick something that is relevant to them and then they start you know, tackling and working on it throughout the design thinking. So in the beginning, they just identify a problem they kind of work through the understand phase to figure out how it impacts people, what the, the ideate into multiple solutions, a prototype and design and create an actual you know, prototype, and then ultimately pitch it. And I will say that through this experience, we support prototypes and thinking along anything along the lines of products or services, right? So it doesn't have, not everything created here has to be a product in the, in the traditional sense. In some cases, we have student teams who, who basically created a solution, I mean, a service, that, that is the solution to their problem. And that's totally acceptable, as well as it doesn't have to be, it can be digital or physical. So there's opportunities for across the board, whatever works best for the students and in your space. We do have a team, we encourage you to help team students think about team culture um, and what they wanna do. There is a team contract and I'll show you that in the impactful after a while that you might wanna consider. There's other resources and tools um, but ultimately, just reminding you to help, you know, helping students identify a problem that is relevant to them in some way is actually really powerful because the ones that, as we all experience, the ones that end up picking a problem that actually has some connection to them tend to actually be the ones that get more excited and, and do, you know, come up with solutions that are more uh, creative and innovative. That's not to say, though, there are some situations, and some of you may be here now, where we've got teachers who have either already pre-selected a global goal that they expect student teams to work toward, or in some cases, they've picked a specific problem. It might be homelessness in your community. And you know you wanna see multiple teams working on that, maybe because that works with your curriculum and your focus, 
All of those things are completely fine. It's completely open and up to you. Monty, Kim asked, are things like system redesign suitable? And Kim, you may want to say a little more about that. I wasn't sure exactly what you meant. Um, yeah, I was just uh, interested in, uh, in students actually like redesigning systems and practices and that sort of stuff as a way of addressing uh, issues. Are those sorts of things um, suitable or are they more looking at, as you said, the, the tangible, like there's a lot of apps always get generated or there's a lot of sort of, and, you know, we saw the umbrellas and other bits and pieces that uh, were created last year. Um, but in terms of more um, sort of uh, systemic approaches to things, so, so issues affecting governance, issues affecting policy making, all those sorts of things, education programs. So Kim, it's a great question. And we will definitely talk about that more when we get to the actual prototyping phase and even the IDA to a degree. I would say the thinking behind some of the, so the in the prototype, what we were trying to encourage people to think about is how can you test it? Um, whatever the it is, right? So it's a product or solution. If you could start thinking about ways, as long as you get students are sending email, like how do I validate my assumptions and the work that we're doing, even a part of it, that's fine. Like that, that's the, it's like creating something that they can actually get some feedback on or an approach to testing it. So whether it's systemic or a service or a product, that's kind of the thinking. Great question. So as I mentioned, the design thinking phases, you'll see these impactful, uh, understand, ideate, prototype, and pitch. Today, we're gonna talk a little bit about, more about the understand phase. Again, that's the same as the empathize um, and define uh, stages you might see in, in other models. Uh, so we're gonna talk about the understand phase in a little bit more detail. Because this is the first one you're gonna start with with students. We approach this, I'm gonna go back actually. We approach our webinars and our, you know, in this challenge, we approach it in a, kind of a linear fashion, starting with, with understand, moving to ideate, prototype, and then pitch. But you can see the arrows here in the model, and that's intentional because when it comes right down to it, we know that you know, creating something in innovation is messy. And it doesn't always start with you know, framing a problem and trying to identify how it impacts people. To Kim's point, sometimes you know, people already have a solution, they already have something they wanna create, and in some cases, it might be the, you know, the educator's opportunity to encourage students to go back and think about how their solution that they've already picked may impact people. So we're gonna go through this in a linear fashion, but we know, and the Pactful app itself supports them working in a non-linear way, and that's very much intentional. Ready to innovate? Let's get started. To help your team understand a social problem, generate innovative ideas, and prototype and test solutions, you'll begin a three-step process known as design thinking. The first phase of design thinking is to deeply understand the problem. In the understand phase, you'll discover the complexity of the problem. During this phase, don't worry about coming up with a solution just yet. To begin, you'll conduct your own research to learn about the issues surrounding the problem. You'll use a variety of resources to gather all the information you can, and you'll identify your current knowledge and assumptions about the issue. Then, you'll connect with people that are experiencing the problem and really get to know them by conducting interviews and possibly observing them to grasp how the problem affects them directly. Once you conduct your research, you'll make sense of everything you've learned by organizing all the information you've uncovered. This will help your team decide on one specific area where you can create a solution. Think about which problem your team finds most critical or exciting and where you can make a difference. How do you want to build a better world? So in the understand phase, um, there are a number of activities that you can encourage students to, to think about, um, and we'll guide you through some of those. But the whole idea here is to do some research and do the framing of the problem. Here, they're taught, you know, they're taught how to avoid making assumptions, learn the uh, importance of being objective, and try to understand the complexity of the problem they've identified. Ready to innovate? I don't know why it always does that twice. All right. <laughs> With that, I'm going to uh, move into a little bit of a demo of the Pactful app. Um, this will be important just so you understand the framing of how this works. I know 
Um, some of you don't want to go through, you know, detailed tech demos, so I'll try to keep this relatively quick. The point is not to talk about the tech, but to also give you enough information so you're prepared to start with students. So anytime you go to the Pactful website, this is our, what we call the public site. You can click sign in once you already have an account. If you don't have an account yet, please go ahead and create one. I sent you a couple of links most people have. There's a few that have not. Um, once you have an account, you can just sign in. Um, I'm going to switch to, um, if you have multiple classes, if it's your first time, you won't, you won't see this, but if you have multiple classes, you can select the class in the drop down at the top. And you can just begin here where we actually guide people to get started is right here at the innovators guide. The innovators guide is that getting started video that we watched earlier. It's a quick introduction to social good innovation, the UN global goals, design thinking, and how Pactful works at the, you know, at a very high level. So um, this is something we encourage, you know, everyone to take a peek at. And then honestly, how to get started. This is that piece about helping your team, you know, take the, do the team member contract, complete a problem hunt activity. This just may help them start to identify an area where they want to kind of focus their energy and pick a problem that they want to tackle. Um, they pick a global goal and then ultimately get started by creating a project. And I'll do that in just a moment. There's a whole section on global goals, it kind of talks about what the global goals are and gives you links to more information that they might be interested in. And then the last piece is this resources tab. Um, there's several resources generally here for you, one of which is this teacher's guide. And I'll be sending you out a link to this directly later, but this teacher's guide is here with all kinds of information about how Pactful works, other activities you might wanna consider, guidance for you know, how you might wanna work with students, et cetera. You don't have to read this, but it is here for you in case you want to have additional tools. So back to the, my dashboard, this is where, um, and teacher dashboard and student dashboard looks similar, but a little bit different. In the teacher's dashboard, you'll see what your, and this will be a four digit code for you guys. I actually have created this one special. Um, this is your class code in case you ever forget it. You can always share this with your students. This is how you invite students into Pactful, is using your class code Students will go to, and uh, let me go back to where we were. I can't go back. I can't see it. <laughs> Students can um, create an account the first time with the, oops, I'm already logged in. So that's not going to let me. Students can um, create an account using a student, and they use your class code to associate their account with your class. And so if you have an again, if you have an existing student, I'm sorry, if you have an exist, if you are a returning teacher to us and your students are joining a new class, they'll have an option underneath their uh, avatar up here to join a new class with your new class code. So you can provide them that. That's how students get invited in. They use your class code and they go to Pactful and sign in using your class code. You can't pre, you can't upload a list of students or anything. They, because it's using a Google account, we can't tap into that. They have to use their Google account to authorize Pactful use. Using your class code, that's how they get associated with you. Getting started, um, you can create, students create a project. At this point, they pick a global goal that feels relevant to them. Um, I'm going to just pick randomly here, get started. They give them uh, trees. They can give themselves a unique, uh, their, their team gets a unique name. They can add any other student that's in your class. In this case, it's just a fake other person, me, but you can add other people, other students in your class right here and the team can manage that. And then they can add a description of their project. So um, apparently I have one here, which doesn't really match, but the land, and, and this is the description of their project that'll appear throughout Pactful. We encourage you to update that throughout but they just get started and then now on their dashboard and students will see this too, there's the card for their project, they get started. And this is really the main navigation for the design thinking phases and the work that they'll do. Click on the understand phase, you'll start seeing this three step process on their three steps on the left, the explore, do and document. We've already watched this explore video, but this is for students. We've got light curriculum content on the explore step. This is intentional, a few videos, a little bit of background and information, and then moving into the activities. In our case, we have each phase has a different number of activities and a different focus. 
In this case, we suggest that students complete at least one research, one empathize, and one organize, and you'll see these uh, activities here. But ultimately, that's up to you. You can tell them, we want, I want you to do this one, I want you to do these three, I want you to do something separate. It's completely up to you to decide how you might want to do it. We've just got guidance in here, but ultimately we believe in the flexibility and allowing you know, educators to make that decision. And uh, can teachers have two or more teams? Absolutely. Um, when the teachers have multiple teams, the teams and their project are linked together. These cards that you as a teacher will see for each one of them. And so students can, be, can join multiple teams or work on a team. You can remove them, add them, whatever's needed and see their progress. And in this case, I haven't done anything yet. I'm gonna to go to the understand phase. I'm gonna look at the activities. This is a re dive into the research in the short video, um, you know, talking about how you can use the research template in order to get started. And then ultimately, the way the feedback loops work is that students and any member of the team can do go to the document step and add the files. Let me. I've got some pre. We'll pretend that this is this one. They add the linked files for their work once they've completed it as a team, and then they send it to you for feedback. Send to teacher. You as the teacher will see on your dashboard, and I'm kind of commingling because I'm doing a little bit of both as my the student. You as a teacher will have this ready for review tab, which PAC will automatically pop in front of you in case if there are things that need to be reviewed. You can see the documents they submitted. You can see the progress they've made, and you can either return it to the team or approve it. If you return it to them, you can say, great start, but I want you to do another activity. Um, all of this is intentional feedback loops. There's no grading or evaluation outside of that. It's helped encourage them to go through that process. Monty, we have a few questions previously. Can, should we go over them right now? Uh, yes. Okay, so there's one um, from Katrina saying that the T activity says to use ingredients on the other side, but there's no other side. So maybe we have to check that activity, that the T activity. Yeah, we may have to look at that and, and look. thank you for pointing that out, Bianca. We can put that on our list to follow up on. And then she also added another question. If the timeline for the prices conflict with their schedule, can they use Pathful? Can they still use Pathful and not submit for prices or what would be? Absolutely. In fact, we have, we have people who are doing that now. We've got people who are working using Pathful in their, you know, courses and content in a regular, you know, way with outside of the challenge. But I would say this is a great opportunity to potentially celebrate their work. So I always try to incur, and again, if it falls completely outside your timeline, then I get that. But if it kind of starts to align closely and you can help them get to a pitch by April 30th, there's great power in, in helping them get to that accomplishment and getting it submitted. Um, and who knows, they, some of them actually end up you know, winning or becoming finalists and that has happened. So it's completely up to you. Okay, and then Abby has a question. Are winners chosen to, to only based on the final videos or on all the work products throughout the process? That's yeah, that's a great question. So um, in the end, our, so what will end up happening is that you'll be working, in some cases, you'll be working with multiple student teams. You may have a whole classroom full of students. And so um, if you have 30 students, you may end up with, you know, eight or 10 teams, I don't know. Um, we'll help you go through this process as we go through the webinars throughout. Ultimately, we'll encourage you to conduct an in-class, an in-classroom pitch competition where you'll have used the pitch rubric, which is the same one that we are ultimately going to use to evaluate the pitches. You'll use the pitch rubric with teams and help them understand how to give feedback for each other. And then for every six teams that an educator is supporting, you are able to submit one of those to us for final prize consideration. So the thinking being that if you're just you know, supporting one group of students, then you can submit them for consideration. If you've got, mo we've got people with upwards of a hundred uh, student teams where they've got co-teachers and working on them. Um, so for every six teams, and we just pick that to kind of try to find the right balance. For every six teams, you can submit one team for consideration. And then we'll look at all of those 
um, prototypes and the final pitch videos and evaluate them using the same pitch, pitch rubric that is impactful um, that you would be using in a classroom to make final decisions on prizes. Thank you. And Charisma has a question. I'm not sure if I understand it correctly, but she's asking what's the best way to match high schoolers to educators. I'm not sure, Charisma, if you're representing the school and you're trying to, if you want to clarify or I don't want to give you get the question. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is our first time and uh, we have a high schooler student, but we are trying to find an educator so we were wondering what would be the best way uh, for student to match with an educator. So in most cases, and I think we may have talked on the phone, um, Krishma, and in most cases, um, we're asking, you know, in most cases, those who signed up are, are serving as the, the mentor or the adult educator helping students. I would encourage you, and this is a great segue, at the top of every page in Packful and on our website, there's a link to the community. And I'm gonna to go to the community. And in fact, right here, we have the Jacobs Teen Innovation Challenge. This is a great place for you all to be able to post and share and seek information to help from each other. And so I would encourage you, if you are looking for something specific where you wanna get a partner or support or working groups, this is a great place where you can seek that out and kind of point out what you're looking for. And if everybody's, you know, we will do our best to help you as best as much as we can, but this is an open community that you can share on and this will be a great place for everyone to communicate with each other. And in fact, we have created one thread and this will also be in the email we send you later, encouraging everyone to reply to this introduce yourself thread to kind of get to kind of what you did in the chat here, but also for those who couldn't join us live, please go ahead and uh, you know make a note in the introduction area in the community and let's get the, uh, conversation started there so that you have opportunities to connect with each other outside of these meetings. I did just want to add to that idea of getting educators involved um, where you might have students but not an assigned teacher to support them, um, which is required to participate in our app and, and, or, and the challenge event itself that one of the feedback that we've received multiple times from teachers is that they actually learned with their students while they're going through this process because everything's already set up. The full curriculum's here. We sequence the, the webinars about the time you should be doing these things in the classroom. Um, it's not like the teacher, whoever does get assigned has to know anything in advance um, other than just really supporting the idea of social innovation because everything is walked through. I mean, kids can literally walk themselves through um, the curriculum itself and these different learning activities. So uh, if you have teachers that might be interested, but they're holding back because it feels like I, I don't know enough or I can't learn enough, they can actually learn um, in sync with the students uh, while this is going on. So I don't know if that's helpful, but I did wanna put that out there. That's great, thank you, Lisa. Um, and, and to recap on that, um, the, the, the meat of what ends up happening is the student teams work on activities. And these activities may be some of our guiding activities, and frankly, they might be activities that you've assigned them um, outside of, of Packable. And then they document the, the work that they've done and submit them. It's this feedback loop, which is why we need an adult educator. Only the educator or teacher in the class can see, uh, when I go back to my dashboard, as the teacher of this class, I can see this ready for review tab. Right now I don't have anything because I just did it, but I'll have that ready for review tab. That tells me that students have submitted something and I need to look at it and give them feedback and either approve it or return it. That's the key piece, which is why we need an adult educator. Or in a, in a case of homeschooling, it could even, it can be a parent. Absolutely. On a, any, any adult. Mentor, any adult. Not any mentor, any right? Any mentor, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. We also have another great question. Can we still have other teachers at our school sign up to participate or is it too late? No, it's actually not too late. Um, we were pushing to get everybody signed up, you know, obviously, you know, in advance of today's kickoff. But since some people can't, this is being recorded. Um, you're welcome to, I would, you know, ideally it would be this week, you know, maybe next week at the latest. But 
this week, particularly if you're they're thinking about the virtual exchange and stuff, we've got some timelines there. So yeah, please encourage them to go to the, the, the link is on the bottom, um, pactful.org. There's a banner at the top of the page and then they can click on that button to join the company, apply to join the competition. And as long as they kind of fit the bill and you know, we're gonna let them in and, and send them all the material. So it's not too late. Okay. We're gonna to get to the Q&A part in a little more detail here and we'll be happy to stay around and help people with as much as they like. So in terms of what's next. So as a reminder, I'm gonna send this in a, via email so you don't have to do anything with this. But if you haven't cre created an account in Packle, please do that. Um, then use your uh, class code to invite students to Packle. Um, invite, you know, introduce yourself uh, in the Packle community and maybe share in case you have other you know, thoughts or comments, or you're looking for other support, please use that as a, as a tool for you. And then if you're looking to join the virtual exchange, please do that by this weekend. Um, and then start working on the understand phase with your students when it works out best. I know folks like Kim aren't gonna see your students for a little while, so you'll have to figure out your timing a little bit differently, um, but start working on the understand phase with your students and then plan to join us for the next webinar on January 27th. I did wanna make a point as you start thinking about your timeline within our timeline, one of the things that the caveats I see, the understand phase, you know, the empathizing and thinking about how it impacts people is so critical, but I've actually also seen educators who spend too long on that and then don't move forward. And the risk of doing that is particularly in the prototype phase where they might be doing building or creating, you might actually need more time for that. So I'd encourage you to think about those elements as you're trying to plan your activities with your students. Okay. That's all of our slides. Um, we were trying to keep it as short as possible while giving you the key information and not boring ever. I still see that many of you hung out with us, which is awesome. We appreciate that. This is a great opportunity to open the floor for you guys to ask each other questions, ask us, make any comments about what you think about the challenge, if you're excited about it, where you're hoping to go, how we can help, any of those things. And if you don't have any, that's okay too, but you can come off of mute or turn on your camera or type in the chat, whatever works best for you. Also, I'll add, uh, si alguien quiere hacer una pregunta en español, también pueden hacerla en español y podemos contestar. That was just the translation. If anybody wants to ask a question in Spanish, they can too. Thank you. Uh, ah, that's fantastic. Tashara, my students literally cheered when asked for the partner with the team. That's great. And yes, you can have many uh, groups in the same school. We can uh, set you up however you like. In a lot of cases, if you think students are gonna be working together, then it probably makes sense for them to be in a single Pactful class, even if they're in separate classes in your school or program, but a single class is what allows them to join a team together. I can help you set up however many classes and co-teachers that you may want. So feel free to, um, if you go to the Packful community, there's a frequently asked questions. There's a number of um, areas where there, and I'll put a link in here to that. There's a number of questions in there that we routinely get that may answer some things. We can set it up however you might like for your situation. So you could have one Packful class for your entire school with you know, eight teachers in there and all working together, or you could have multiple classes separating them out. However, it's best for you. We're happy to help set that up. But you can't have uh, teachers, like co-teachers, one class with their students and yep. they can both share the work and see the work. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. And any, of, I think I saw this question earlier, kind of re, any of the evidence that students submit for you to review impactful, um, because it's using, so it's really evidence within Google Drive, so they can do anything, whether it's an image, a photo, whatever they can put in Google Drive, they can submit um, to you for consideration, and Pactful changes the permissions on those files um, so that you can definitely see them. We can't always, but that's okay. It's really about you being able to see those documents, which in most cases, if students are using Google Drive, 
Um, in a school setting, you can already do that. But if they happen to be using personal Google accounts, which I know some of you have to use because you don't have Google at your school and that's okay, um, it does help to make sure that you can always see those things. Um, some of these questions we might have answered, but there was another one. Can we have more than two groups from the same school? Yes, Hi. definitely. Uh, you can have as many groups as possible. Like I said, the best way to organize them within, the best way if you think about it in terms of Pactful setup is a Pactful class is, you know, a, a universe of students who may wish to work together on a project. So if you've got a situation where they're literally in separate physical classes or something, you may want two classes. Um, but if you have a situation where they're all working together in a program, you can put them into one class and then they can join a team together. Can, can I ask a question? Please. Thank you. Um, I'm, the, I'm the one who's here with a robotics team. Um, and they, uh, and maybe there's others too, I, I'm not sure, but um, the, the, in the past, um, when they've competed in first, there have been periodic innovation challenges. Um, the way that they're hoping to do this one is all of them together working on the same project. But I heard you say that the ideal team size is three to four. I will probably have about 10 to 12. What do you recommend? Yeah, you're, you're a great example of situations that may not always fit the mold, right? So what we were thinking is that I think 10 to 12 on a team generally working together is probably a bit cumbersome, right? So I wouldn't advise that for, for most people, but you've got a unique scenario where you're already doing that and that's totally fine. Um, however works best for you. They can all be on one team. There's no limit within the app. It's just more of our guidance for people coming along for the first time. Jen, are you trying to get them to do the chairman's award with this? I don't, I don't, I haven't heard of the award. What's the chairman's award? Oh, it's through first. It's their community service based projects and you present your community service impact project to the panel and first will give awards and access to like the world championship uh, championship if you get the chairman's award. Well, this this team has not made it to the world competition before. Um, they're they're happy if they get to regionals. Um, and and so fun. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they they just really enjoyed working on the innovation challenge last year, so they're looking forward to this. But I'll I'll connect with you because maybe you can share some tips. Absolutely. Um, questioning for people who have done this before, uh, in terms of time to commit to this, how long do you usually give your students? to commit because I only see my group of like students for about a half an hour a day. And we do have a variety of other things that are response that they're responsible for in, in our school community. Um, but about how long does it take? That's a great question with a really open ended answer, right? So as I mentioned, we have some educators who effectively work with their students throughout the entire school year, like they started last fall. We have others who are only gonna be, be together for you know after school for a month or two and you have to work within that. We ourselves are conducting a camp where we're gonna do it over a five day period, you know, three to four hours every day. Um, you can kind of scaffold, I would just take the amount of time you have available and kind of chunk it up into four sections. So you kind of have the understand, ideate, prototype and pitch. I'd probably squeeze out a little bit more time for prototyping if you can. Um, it's important to kind of have those markers in place um, only so that you can make sure that you move forward, right? So that you have, you don't spend forever on one phase. You say, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do the best we can to understand for the X period of time. And then we're going to move on because I do think there's incredible value in hitting all of the phases, even if you can only do so in a limited way. So in some cases we've got, you know, folks who end up working on one activity per phase with their students because that's all they have time for. Um, others work on many of them because they have, a, you know, have them the same students for you know, uh, several weeks or a month and they can work on the understand phase for that long. Um, so it's completely up to you, half an hour every day or you know, whatever, it works out best. Just take your timeline and kind of chunk it into four sections and then think about it in that way leading up to April 30th. 
And Jessica, we've seen enthusiastic teams, um, you know, as it gets closer to the end, working on their own outside of school hours, that happens too. Uh, you know, the kids get energy and they have their assigned roles and they're working on activities they want to work on. It's not even involving the teacher um, at that point. So it just depends on the age of the kids and, and their own motivation um, to carry out the work. But I do think Monty's suggestion of breaking it into the time chunks that you have, we've gotten through the whole design thinking process and pitch in an hour and 10 minutes um, with groups on site. We've been able to go through that whole cycle, just like how short can we condense it, you know, to get through so people at least have a taste of it. And so I think anything beyond that, it's all just the more time you spend, the deeper you get, the richer the solutions are. And it may be helpful on that note to look at some of the solutions from last year, a couple of them. I think there's a couple that were fantastic. Um, my personal favorite was actually the second place team it was a, a team from uh, these two girls from Japan who created a basically a, their service model was to recycle and repurpose ballet shoes. A topic kind of back to the whole like topic that I was like, I don't know anything about that. They were passionate about this. It came through in their project and they lived, they created something that was just fantastic and they ended up winning um, second place, but it was really their drive and interest, I think, that kind of carried them through. Well, thank you guys. I it's we're losing light up here in Alaska, so it is time for me to go take my dogs out for a walk before. Thank, thank you for joining. Start. Thank you so much. Thank you. And throughout, if you have, you know, questions or comments, please, you know, send us an email or shoot us a, you know, a creative post on the community. That would be a great way to kind of communicate with us and each other. I'm hoping to kind of set that tone, but um, we really appreciate you joining us today. I will stay around in case you, anyone has any other questions or comments, but I'm going to go ahead and officially stop the recording. <laughs>